All right, man. So we're, this is number three. How are you doing? Fine. And you? Great. So it's been a really, really busy two or three weeks since our last episode yes. where we did WRL. And it's we're going to go up the stack today. We're, today's all about C++ CX when we get to that point. That's great. But you've been really busy with the community, man. So what's going on? You know, I was checking what was happening in the community after the build event in general, in forums, events and blogs, you know, and other channels. And it's like the momentum is not now fading, but actually increasing. Interesting. I, I'm really glad to see that, you know. So, for instance, in the last week, a lot of things happened about C++ in the community that were not Microsoft things, but the community talking, blogging, or presenting about things we were doing. Good. So I, I can mention, you know, we have for sure our most valuable professional programs. These are highlighted people from the community who are in general blogging or answering in forums about our technologies. And I can mention the case of Marius Vansila okay. from Romania. Cool. Nishant Sivakumar, uh, he's from India. I think he lives in the US. Uh -huh. And for sure, Canadian heroine Kate Gregory. Yes. She, you know, she presented uh, this week a webcast in an independent site about building Windows 8 applications. Mm. And she also released a complete training on w uh, developing Windows 8 applications with XAML and C++. Nice. We are amazing, Kate. you know? I mean, Rock star. Their stories could be your story as well, you know? They are already starting making money, you know, with these technologies. This could be your case as well. So I'm really delighted. There are also in some, some geographies like Argentina, France, Germany, and even Poland, mm -hmm. there were, you know, talks about C++ with or without, you know, Metro or XAML technologies this week. So I'm seeing an increase in the activity Good. that is happening. And for sure, as I said, I'm really glad. Yeah. Something else that I noticed What's is that? that some people working today, you know, in iOS applications yep. are checking with certain interest Metro style, the Metro style programming model. Sweet. And I started seeing the first applications being ported. That is also a good news, you know? I mean, you don't need to stop working on one platform, but if you can expand, you know, your, in certain way, your reach, it's always good for you, you know? It's actually sure. your business. So good. those are, you know, in general, the news That's the I news. have to, to That's tell. good news. So what about the C++ conformance thing? So Herb had a Dr. Dobbs article in the yes. Channel 9, Epic Channel 9 threads and the Epic VC blog threads, but what's the, What's the official sort of? Okay, well, I, and also we cannot ignore, you know, there's user voice that is the feedback tool for suggestions the community has. Mm -hmm. And at this time, the, you know, support more C++ 11 features, it's topping the list regarding all the suggestions for Visual C++. Mm -hmm. So I just replied that this is under review at this time, and I want to repeat what Herb Sutter said to Dr. Dobbs oh. magazine. All right. It's something that it will probably not come in Dev 11, I mean, no, not more, or Visual, Visual Studio 11, not more than the features we mentioned in our blog. Mm -hmm. That uh, There are things that are coming, but we are not in parity with GCC, maybe, or, or other compilers. But developers won't have to wait until the next release, I mean, the release after Visual Studio 11 Great. in order to get those, you know? So at, the, at this moment, it's the only thing we can Cool. But disclose. keep on talking and keep sending mail to, to this guy. OK. Uh, and keep pushing him. So, uh, Slapping me. Well, I mean, it's good, though. It's, it, you know, it's, it, when you think about it, a lot of the investment that was made in C++ CX mm -hmm. and WRL and the whole WinRT stuff, I mean, we're going to go find out today sure. from one of the members of the C++ CX design team. Absolutely. One of which is Jim Springfield, and you posted his blog yesterday, and you should definitely go read that. Uh, it's a nice kind of short write-up about why they decided to go the way they did. Absolutely. And with Marion, we're going to hopefully, we're going to go a little bit deeper. We're going to get him on sure. the whiteboard. We're going to kind of have him geek out a little bit with us and go under a little bit more. Excellent. And I think people are, by the end of the day, I think they're going to understand that it's making COM programming mm -hmm. easier 
on WinRT. Sure, let, let's Period. repeat it this time. You know, there are certain people who are already aware and working on COM. When they saw the new syntax, they said, no, I prefer to have more grip on what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the role of, of you know, Windows Runtime Library. Mm -hmm. For people who are newcomers, and in particular, uh, something I'm noticing sure. about a lot of C Sharp developers who want to take advantage about the opportunity of getting their code running on the metal, they don't want to understand the internals of COM. And they don't want either, you know, to understand double URL, I mm -hmm. mean the Windows Runtime Library. So for them, the extended syntax we are covering today with Marian, mm -hmm. it's perhaps the best option. And I confess, it's also the best option for me. Well, listen, there's nothing wrong. I mean, it's ref, new, mm -hmm. and hats. And there's a couple more things. But come on, man. It, I mean, the, 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 in my opinion, I agree with you. There's going to be ch times, though, when you need yes. to get down to that certain totally. level to fine tune things. Totally. That's what native developers do. But the point Always. is, C plus plus CX is native code. Mm -hmm. Period. Compiled to native. Rock and roll, man. So we're going to go talk to Marian Leparo, super Excellent. smart young guy, and uh, we'll come back and close things up. Excellent. Right on. Well, wait a See minute. You. Wait, wait, wait. We can't okay. do that because then we're going to destruct, man. Yes, 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 yes. Let's go on. All right. So we are here uh, with Marian Leparo who is, in some sense, one of the faces of C++ CX. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Great, thanks for coming on. So last time Great on Going Native, we focused on WRL, because we like to start at the lower level. Now we're moving up to C++ CX. We didn't spend a lot of time on the C++ CX. You being one of the designers of the language, you wanted to come here and kind of get a sense from you of sort of why. Right? Right. Why did you do this? Like, why did you make C++ CX, design decisions, etc. So take it away, man. All right. Uh, well, so I'm a program manager on the team. And um, for the past two years, I've been working, uh, kind of moving from the library side, working on WRL, uh, that you mentioned, to towards a more language-focused um, work. And I've been part of the design working group, as you mentioned, with uh, great people. You know Herb Sutter. Yes. He has been the, the lead of the um, uh, design working group. And uh, we had uh, Jim Springfield, which is the author of ATL and a lot of other stuff that he did in part of the C++ team, like working on IntelliSense. Uh, we had uh, Mark Hall, which is the architect on the compiler side, nice. and he knows the compiler inside out. Uh, we had uh, Sridhar, which you already met. Yeah. He was part of uh, the WRL effort and as well as the language design. And uh, Dion, which has, uh, by the way, a great session uh, available on the build website with the inner workings of the C++ CX. Yes. Um, and I should also mention the uh, um, Ben Kuhn, which is a developer in the Windows team. He's okay. been part of the same working group. Uh, he was kind of giving us the, the input of what Windows was planning to do with WinRT and how we should surface that in C++. It turns out he has a big passion on C++, so mm -hmm. it was a great influence on the group as well. So th this kind of group of, of seven people mm -hmm. uh, were involved in kind of putting the basis of the design. Um, then we kind of moved to, towards the implementation phase where we had the whole front-end team, the libraries team working, focused focusing on this. Mm -hmm. So I, I just kind of uh, wanted to give an introduction of who were the people working on this. But, That's great. Um, kind of what are the goals? Yes. And, uh, um, first of all, um, Windows 8 um, came in as, uh, as a wanted to change the rules of the game and how developers write apps. So we definitely wanted to make sure that C++ is part of that scenario, uh, together with, uh, as you know, CLR and JScript. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that um, those three languages are well represented and immediately can start consuming WinRT APIs. Um, and what we initially started with, was with um, a scenario list. And that was as simple as that. We didn't know that we were going to end up doing language projections or maybe a library-only implementation and so on. But what we really needed to ace were, were the um, ability for C++ developers to write great metro apps using the new XAML UI infrastructure such that you have a complete native app with cool UI. The other scenario was um, um, having uh, JScript and HTML5 applications being able to tap into the native power uh, that C++ provides and creating the seamless integration between uh, those two languages, which is something that WinRT provides. So again, it kind of boils down to making sure that we have a great experience for WinRT. And last but not least, there was uh, the ability to write DirectX games that work in Metro. Mm. And as part of that, we did a lot more than just a new language uh, that you can use for some of that. DirectX, though, remains COM-based. 
so you will use a mix of WRL and uh, C++ CX. Um, but in addition to j uh, language and libraries tools, we also provide a lot of ID enhancements. So definitely check out Boris's talk at Build that talks a lot about DirectX as well. I'm going to probably mm -hmm. um, focus more on the language side and C++ CX for, that's for this That's great. Talk, so. And that's exactly what we want to do because, again, as you said, there's a ton of great content uh, from the Build uh, uh, conference uh, yes. on Channel 9. And uh, watch that stuff. Um, but in this case, um, there's been some time has gone by and people have provided feedback and so some of the stuff that is sort of interesting to kind of get an understanding of is why did you choose C++ CX? Why did you choose the CLI like syntax? And further, yes. why not just use a library wrapper? So those yes. are a couple so questions. Those are definitely uh, questions that we had on the table from the beginning and uh, uh, it was not a, a fast decision I can tell you for sure. Um, First of all, we ended up delivering two different things. We ended up uh, shipping a library that eventually got the name WRL, Windows Runtime Library, and uh, the language extension called C++ CX, the hats and the ref news. Um, <laughs> and um, when we started, um, as I said, we only wanted to target WinRT and wanted to make sure that we use COM consumption and COM authoring. So we had some of the some design goals in mind. Uh, like first of all, we wanted to design a, a library or language that is exception-based, that allows you to consume WinRT APIs in an exception-based manner. Mm. Um, so uh, we kind of started with WRL in the beginning, and as we started designing it more and more, our first customer was Windows. And Windows, um, internally, a lot of the teams in Windows don't use exceptions. They, they're an exception-free word, so we kind of started focusing that library into a, an exception-free environment, but also trying to keep that library um, available to be targeted towards an exception-based model, but that didn't last too long. So um, if I can use the board really quick, Please. I can give you a really quick example of Great. why that didn't work out. Great. All right, so um, WRL basically, in WRL we had one method called as, which is uh, a wrapper of uh, query interface in COM. Mm -hmm. So you would write something like we have a computer of IFU, uh, f. And to cast to a different interface, you do f as i bar. And once you get out, you could write auto uh, b equals. And what will, this will give you will, will give you a competitor of i foo if the conversion succeeded. If it doesn't succeed, it will give you null. Mm. Um, with uh, our design in mind, that eventually. Uh, if this fails in an exception-based environment, we'll actually throw here, and you'll be able to try catch and use the usual um, exception-based programming that you would use. Mm -hmm. um, but now, coming back to the exception-free environment, uh, we gave this design to Windows initially, and the immediate feedback that we got was, well, in query interface, actually, I get the pointer back, but I also get an H result explaining to me why the failure in case of failure. So uh, rather than them saying just if b equals equals null putter, which was the failure case, mm -hmm. they really wanted to drill deeper into the details and say, well, the H result said RPC termination, or uh, it was a failure because the interface is not implemented, and so on, and kind of handled that scenario specially. Mm. So we, ended back, we, we went back to the API and said, well, it cannot be um, an API that returns you a COM putter it needs to return you the H result. And this kind of ties in with basically all the non-exception based APIs that return H result and anything that you, you're getting out of that API is an out-read file param. Mm. So right now you'd basically do something like this. I'll have to double check the exact syntax, but you definitely need an H result here. And here's where you do the check. And this kind of difference between exception-based programming and exception-free programming made us uh, realize that, well, besides WRL, which is going to be a great, we want to focus and make that a great experience for exception-free programming, we need to design something else that will be specifically targeted towards exception-based programming. And kind of exception-based programming gives you the ability to um, chain calls. Mm -hmm. So obviously, a um, quick example of that would be, let's say, you have a, I'm going to make this API up. I right. don't know if it exists, but you do a get socket, and because get socket returns you a socket, you can do I don't know, get stream, and get stream returns you a stream, and then you could do read bytes, 
with the int, let's say. And this actually would be an int i equals, and I got the int out of the chain of calls. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in an exception-free environment, this will not work because each of the methods here will return an h result. So you write this linearly, and in every call, you would check the h result and kind of step back, do the error handling, then again call the next method, and so on. Mm -hmm. This allows you to do this, and of course, if socket was never created, you're going to get an exception here, mm -hmm. so none of these methods will actually get called. Mm -hmm. If the socket is open but the stream was closed, let's say the remote stream closed it, then you're going to, the termination will end here and you're not going to try to read the ints. So you still maintain the correctness of your program even by chaining this. Mm -hmm. And eventually you do a try-catch here, let's say. Well, don't do dot, 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 but you would catch the specific exception that you, you want to handle, yeah. and, and uh, this is how you write your program. So definitely exception-based programming was very important. This is kind of, when we realized this, this is when, when we formed the, work, for, formed the working group that I was mentioning earlier, and we said, well, we need to look at all the options. There may be library exception, uh, libraries or uh, language exceptions. Mm. Um, so this was one of the first things that we, we closed. Uh, another thing that turned out as we were designing um, uh, this, the Windows kind of was moving towards an inheritance-based model. So interfaces like IFU and IBAR, even if they're at the ABI level, don't inherit one from the other, they're really designed for the language projections to show them as inheritance. Mm. So one example of that, and I'll just quickly erase this. So we really want to say uh, IFU you know, inherits from IBAR, let's say. Now, when you write ifu star, let's ignore computer for a while, but when you say arrow, we really want to see all the methods of ifu and ibar. And you can do that if you, if you surface it as inheritance, but it's not real inheritance because the v tables of ifu and ibar have no relation whatsoever. The only guarantee that when our team makes in such a relationship is that QIing, query interface in ifu, will, will succeed for ibar. Okay. That's how WinRT works. So now, another thing that works here because of this inheritance is you have i bar pb equals pf, which is an implicit conversion from, from derived to base. And interestingly enough, this is not something that uh, you can do with computer because you know you have a computer, fi foo, and it equals some value, computer of i bar. will not implicitly inherit from computer vi vifu. There's no, there's no library way of saying, well, I'm writing a wrapper type called computer of t, and I'm going to make computer of t class inherit from all the bases of, the com of, of t, for example. Okay. So that's another limitation that kind of makes us think, OK, we need to look at language extensions as well, like, as much as we want to focus on the library-only implementation. Interesting. Yeah. Now, of course, one of the other things about this new world um, is the fact that you're going to be having C++ applications that interact, interoperate with definitely exception-based ones like C Sharp. Correct. Yeah. And so it's good to have some way to be able to, if the C Sharp component throws an exception and somehow surfaces up to you, you're not going to sit there and go, hmm? Yeah, right. well, exactly. Uh, so. the, the mental model needs to be the same <laughs> as consistency as possible. And sure. that comes very important um, in the scenarios that we envision interopting for, where you actually author your component in C++ and consuming it in a JScript environment or, or C Sharp environment. And that kind of tilted the, 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 the balance towards the language projection extension, because take this method, for example, the read int that returns you an int. Um, at the ABI level, this really is is an h result, uh, read int, and really it's an out rad valparam of type int star. This is the signature of the ABI level, and this is what users will have to write without any help from, from our, our language projections. Mm. So in the consumption, obviously, when in an exception-based programming, we would take the outread value param and make it a return value, like I was saying here earlier. So the signature of the method that you would call is readint. And this can be achieved both with a library implementation or a language implementation. We did that with pound import of a type library in the past. Okay. Um, 
and we provide all those wrappers at the consumption level that, well, okay, take the age result. If the age result is a failure, then throw an exception, and you kind of only call this signature of the method, and it kind of hides all the calm goo behind it. But at the implementation side, well, what do we want users to write? Do we really want them to write this method in, in a class that, say, that implements this? We implement read it. No, what we actually want them to write is exactly this thing, because this is an exception-based programming. And the moment you start talking about implementing such a method, because of the inter, uh, interdependencies between the methods you could have in this class, uh, you cannot really talk about a library-only implementation where we allow you to write this class, and then we maybe create a wrapper on top of it that it's age result based and calls into these methods. Mm -hmm. We really need to be baked in into the language, and the moment you author this uh, method inside your, your class, we already have the underlying low-level implementation for it that calls into it okay. and makes it an ABI-friendly class. Excellent. So this is kind of the there are some examples of things that kind of made us go through the language projection side. And um, again, I, I didn't write ref class here because we weren't there yet. Like it took even more and more design uh, time to get to uh, what um, the C++ CLI syntax is and realize how close we are to that. Sure. That to make the, the leap forward. So. Now, just to, I kind of want to kind of focus on this just quickly. I mean, it's in a lang it's a language extension, but there aren't that many extensions. I mean, it's like there's Refnu and there's uh, Hats. What else? Those are the the major okay, building so blocks that you would use. There are a few other uh, constructs that you will need to kind of interact with, like delegates and events okay. and properties. But, um, but mainly those are mapped directly to what what what, to what the WinRT team offers. Yes. yes. Exactly. Refnu and hats are what you would need to first understand to start reading WinRT code that other people write and actually start scribbling some code on your own uh -huh. to call WinRT APIs. Okay. And uh, what hat basically is, it's a pointer. Um, uh, the size of a hat is the size of a, of a star, and you can use hats where, where you can use stars as well, um, except bleating. You don't want to do mem copy of a hat, mm -hmm. but um, you can put them in a vector, you can put them in, uh, in uh, arrays, you can pass them as parameters. Um, hey, they're even ABI safe. We can pass them across the boundary because we know now WinRT boundaries are ABI safe. We, we, we can get back to that. Okay. So, um, in addition to that, people should, COM experts should look at hats as competitors. That, that's the basic semantics that hats give in, uh, on top of pointers. Okay. Um, it's a ref counted pointer, basically, and compilers takes care of managing the lifetime. So as the hat goes out of scope, we will correctly call release for you. You assign the hat to another hat, we'll automatically call add ref. If it's a different type of hat, we will call query interface for you and make sure that, you know, in case the conversion fails, we we'll throw an exception that tells you, hey, you maybe did the wrong conversion, okay. and so on. For refnu, refnu is the magical keyword that you need to use to to activate uh, an instance of a WinRT type. Okay. That that's all that it does, and it kind of papers over what uh, the actual uh, WinRT code would look like. Uh, again, Windows offers APIs to activate a class. So it's a raw activate instance that you pass a string with a type name and you get back a raw I unknown or I inspectable interface. But that's outside kind of the uh, lifetime managed environment that we try to offer uh, developers. So obviously, in the same sense, I already deleted that. In the same sense, we're trying to, um, for competitor to give you a competitor only word by uh, wrapping query interface in as methods that rather than returning your raw pointers to give you competitors in the same way we try to do with hats as well. And that's what RefNew does. It gives you an already ref counted uh, pointer back. Mm. So you just basically, yeah, let's see, I can get, get rid of this. Um, you'll always get, you, you don't even need to write the type. Uh, Good you know, old C++ 11. Yep. So RefNew URI. Uh, which is in Windows Foundation, I believe, okay. namespace, uh, would give you a URI hat. So you don't need to worry about managing its lifetime. Basically, behind the scenes, this will call um, sorry, the Windows raw activate instance. And the compiler will provide for you the actual string to Windows Foundation URI and get back a uh, you know, raw pointer and map that pointer into, into a ref counted word. And as it goes out of scope, we will automatically go call 
release for you. Okay. And if it's the only reference that you have to that object, release will go to zero, and that's the final release. In COM terms, the object goes and gets deleted from memory. Excellent. That, that's what basically uh, ref new papers over. And it, it's not a lot of magic. You could write this code, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't be in a, in a ref counted word. Sure. And you know, the question I would ask, I mean, I think the immediate question is, why does it matter to be in a ref counted world? I mean, in some sense, I mean, that's my question. Right. It, it's a mix of things. It, it's all the, all the benefit you're getting from a ref counted world, plus the exception based programming, plus the inheritance based programming. Um, and um, not having to worry about uh, deleting stuff, it's, it's what we consider modern C++ today. And it kind of maps very well with um, uh, the TR1, well, with Sherpa. Yeah, I was going to uh, say, if I use well, a Sherpa, right? I don't delete explicitly. Yeah, you do exactly the same thing. Uh, it's, it's this lifetime managed word Got that it. we want to expose to C++ developers such that they less and less use raw pointers and mm -hmm. get into, you know, uh, uh, Le leaking or double deletion scenarios of course. that cause error in programs. But the question I think we're seeing from people is, in some sense, does this take away from my ability to do some of the pointer arithmetic magic I need to do to accomplish, say, some super performant uh, image decoder or image encoder or image processor? Right. And of course, the answer is no. You just just do it. Use it. Use it in the library. Exactly. But let's let's make let's bring that point home yet again. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so this is yeah. boundary layer code. Absolutely. Okay. And all ISO C++ code can be still written even if you enable this mode uh, of actually making the C++ CX extensions available to you. In programming, you can still write ISO C++. You can use the STL libraries correctly. And you can do raw pointer semantics, like, mm -hmm. like you're just saying, with deep image processing mm -hmm. and so on. Um, when you're done with that and you squeeze basically the most performant uh, algorithm out of, uh, out of uh, your code, you can wrap that in a WinRT uh, C++ CX class and expose it to maybe JScript or C, or C Sharp. If, if you don't need to do that, don't even use C++ CX. It's only when, when you want to interop with, uh, with uh, those languages or you want to create a, uh, a XAML UI application that, that you, you get to Okay, so that I, okay, that brings CX. up a kind of a good point that um, Ion Toradel sort of asked about. Mm -hmm. He's a Niner and also works at Microsoft. Cool. Uh, he's a native native uh, dev, but he, I think he's an engine, uh, soft, uh, test engineer. But mm -hmm. he's a native dev. And Ion was asking about sort of data binding mm -hmm. to XAML specifically and how that works. So that's kind yes. of a nice thing that you just threw out there in terms, because you said specifically you know, I asked a question about, hey, do you guys have any questions about C++ CX? And the first question cool. that came back was from Ion, and it was about they essentially what you just said. Okay. So the fact that if you want to interact, interoperate with XAML, you need to use C++ CX. Yes. You just said that. So the, what I would then kind of morph his question a little bit, I don't know what the data binding story is. I don't know if that's essentially known yet. But if you can go there, go there. If you can't, we can talk about you know, why you need to have C++ CX to interoperate with XAML. Right. So uh, either way. I'll, I'll answer the, uh, the, the question shortly, uh, condensed. Uh, data binding basically requires that you, you deal with C++ CX objects. So mm -hmm. uh, it, won't, it won't work directly with C++ uh, raw types. Um, in addition to C++ CX, it requires additional specific interfaces that you need to implement to satisfy the data binding requirement that XAML UI has. Mm. So um, we actually have some good examples, even a template that we ship as part of the build build. If you create it, um, it will give you an example of a ref class uh, that it's, I think it's called data sample, very, very specifically named as an example of um, how to do data binding in C++. And of course, it's a lot of code. Uh, it looks a lot like dynamic uh, dispatching, so C++ developers need to be aware of that, that it, it is sort of a dynamic uh, discovery of your type, mm. and it requires a lot of string manipulation, so it's not direct invocation of a vtable call. You get some performance penalties from that, but you also get the benefit of a data binding, uh, which means you have an array or, or, or collection of people Mm -hmm. person objects, and you bind it directly to a list of in XAML UI, and all your uh, person objects show up in that list, and you can scroll, you can tap, you can do all, yep. the, all the gestures that you're used to without actually writing so many lines of code. You just need to provide this adapter layer 
between uh, your native types to XAML. And it's, that it will be done through C++ CX. Excellent. That's good. Yep. All right. So there's your question answered, Ion. Um, and we'll get to a couple other questions from, from customers as well. But let's, I guess we should continue on with uh, the thread that we were on here. Right. And I think uh, we're kind of getting to uh, how the syntax is similar to C++ yes. CLI. Uh, I was mentioning uh, that we didn't start with that. Uh, but as we were drilling through the design process and kind of figuring out um, how the implementation side will look like, we were seeing more and more that we're trying to solve the same problems that we, we solved uh, five years ago uh, with, five, probably more than that, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, C++ CLI. And, um, I think uh, specifically we had this realization of hats when we're talking about dereferencing pointers. And what mm -hmm. does it mean to dereference a WinRT pointer that it's ref counted? And are you losing the reference counting semantics when you deref? Absolutely, that would be a bad thing because then you're going to bring it back to um, you, you take its address and now you have a raw pointer rather than a ref counted pointer. So mm. what's the mechanism of keeping that ref counted, uh, the knowledge of a ref counted pointer when you're derefing? And hey, we solved this problem with, uh, with C++ CLI, it was called percent, it was a, 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 a reference, a tracked reference. Mm. In, uh, in the com word, it's not a tracked reference. Um, per se, it's a ref counted reference because kind of the, the, the lifetime management semantics changes, but it, it is indeed the same kind of characters that we need to use in uh, two different semantically um, related topics. And, uh, there was one, then we kind of um, moved to authoring to, to ref classes and inheritance. Inheritance of ref classes is a specific thing that XAML UI requires in its design. And, uh, Behind the scenes, it's actually a COM aggregation. Mm. So people familiar with COM will will, uh, uh, will know. That, oh, that's it's very complicated uh, machinery uh, there. And in addition to just being a COM aggregation, we also need to make sure, for example, that uh, for virtuals and overrides, we usually make sure we detect which method we need to call mm. at all times. Like the, we need to call the most derived type of um, method and. That wizardry it gets it gets implemented behind the scenes by the compiler without you needing to worry, and um, it looks like the syntax turned out that we can actually support it and it looks exactly like C++ CLI. Sure. With that said, uh, it is C++ CLI syntax uh, on some specific aspects. What we realize in the design process is that we don't need all the C++ CLI syntax uh, concepts like interior putter or pin putter. That they have no place in, in native code. In native mm -hmm. code, you should just be able to reference native types directly. Yep. And um, we kind of added more things to C++ CLI, like the native embedding mentioning uh, that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the STL interop. Um, that it should seamlessly work. There is no reason why you would use any other containers in C++ and when. Uh, how does that interop with WinRT? That, that was the question that we answered. And, sure. Um, That's excellent. As well as taking WinRT collections out of uh, uh, WinRT and seeing and working with STL algorithms. That, that is enabled as well. Great. And it should be because there's some really good algorithms in there and yes. excellent containers. Absolutely. I mean, that's what yes. it's all about. Uh, and it's standard. Right, so you it can is. do ISO C++, standard C++, use the STL, do all of the stuff there, and that can actually interoperate seamlessly with WinRT objects as long as they're communicating through the, Win the, uh, the, uh, the C++ bound boundary, C++ yes. CX boundary. So it's always uh, something to keep in mind as you write your apps, uh, mm -hmm. C++ apps, you, you want to um, write them completely in ISO C++ and keep that, that boundary as, as thin as possible and as less chatty as possible. Great. Um, and that, that will actually enable you to have good, that, good performance. So and that's also, something just to, the, I mean, in the last um, Going Native episode, that's something exactly at the end of the episode we discussed. And one of the questions I asked was, how thin can that wrapper really be? So. Yep. I'd love to ask you that question. I mean, I would like to write almost no C++ CX, for example. Just enough to guarantee a great Metro app experience for, for the native code that's being written, and also for something from, say, JavaScript to be able to seamlessly call into, into right. my functionality, and we can provide this sort of hybrid world. So certainly, the, the level of C++ CX code that, that you can write, it's dialable. 
and uh, with uh, with a good interrupt between um, mixing WRL with uh, with C plus plus CX, you can alternate the, the type of object that you create. Um, so um, also. All your code that consumes WinRT types can also be optimized to not use C++ CX hats, but kind of drop down to I unknown and kind of do, do your own query interface. So it's it's mainly uh, um, a choice of taste and how much you right. want to optimize. Of course, your program as well. It's also a question of performance. Mm -hmm. uh, you will find that as you as you do that more and more often, and you try to minimize the C++ CX layer, uh, that you're writing the same code that the compiler would do most of the time. Mm. So uh, I would argue that uh, if you don't want to write a lot of C++ CX code, mm. as you start writing the low-level code mm. and compare it with C++ CX, you're going to start writing more and more C++ CX code. Yeah. Because in the end, the compiler does uh, a lot of these things for you. And um, one of the big advantages of the compiler doing it for you is also guarantees correctness. Mm -hmm. And um, as we work on the compiler and we, we, we take more revisions uh, of, and more changes, mm -hmm. uh, further optimizations can be done to, to that uh, code, such that, for example, the, the backend compiler can recognize patterns in the code that you would find only by uh, if, if, a, if the compiler generated that code and could be optimized in a future release. Mm -hmm. As opposed to writing native code, yes, you could optimize the best of it uh, to, to, to your knowledge, but there is also always sure. um, this lack of improvement in future release. Like, whatever you're writing now, you get. Mm -hmm. That's the performance you're getting. Yeah. Um, but of course, you can write uh, the, the code very performant, and um, that's definitely recommended. Like, try profiling your apps, see where you get the least performance, and those are specific areas, specific sections of your app that you can uh, hand tune uh, mm -hmm. to your own liking. So, for example, you don't want to always check each results and throw exceptions. If you're in a tight loop of calling a method, you know, 100,000 times mm -hmm. a second, like in a DX app, you definitely want to drop to H results and maybe even ignore the H result. Mm -hmm. And you want to continuously make calls of refreshing the screen, refreshing the screen, bring back, bring objects into the view, and so on. So. Sure. No, it makes sense. That is performance critical. And they, that's yeah. the great. That's a great answer. I mean, it, it depends. The the wonderful thing that you guys have done is you've created a, you know, a high level abstraction at the language level. And let's be honest, ref new and hats. Is, it's not a big deal, man. It's not a big I deal. I don't think it is. All right. So it's not like all of a sudden it looks like a new language. I think some people definitely were a little, a little shocked. I mean, I know I was when I first saw this because it didn't look like C plus plus to me. It looked like C plus plus CLI. Yes. Which immediately <laughs> made me go, hmm. Is it managed? But, but I mean, still, well, we knew, I knew it wasn't managed because there, that, that wouldn't make, because WinRT is, is native. Yes. But yes, okay. you're right. That's what, so a lot of people did ask that question. I mean, what is this? But beyond that, it's nice that you've made this high level abstraction that makes COM programming easier. So with that said, there's a question from Matt, who is a super bright young man who, you know, is on Facebook, one of the, the going native, uh, Facebook group as well as the C++ Enthusiast cool. Facebook group. I think he owns that group, Matt. Nice job, man. He has a question essentially about, it's great that, that you guys have managed to, to make it easier to write COM uh, on Windows, right? Yep. So, that's what you've done in some sense. Um, and I, of course, Windows gets credit for that too. Of course. How can I take this C++ CLI or C++ CX, CX and use it for other COM environments? Say, not WinRT. No, we not. Well, that's an interesting question, and it has, I think, moving forward and uh, more and more releases of Windows and other platforms, we'll see more and more of WinRT coming up. So there's going to be a, a bigger surface, and kind of asking the question whether C++ CX will support non-WinRT scenarios will become irrelevant because more and more code will be written in WinRT. Mm -hmm. I hope more and more of the Win32 APIs will move to WinRT, and uh, that will kind of uh, render the point moot. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, we are looking at uh, ways to improve C++ CX and make it uh, uh, access different other areas than WinRT. We don't have any plans for this release, obviously. The focus was WinRT. Of course. We're definitely looking very interestingly at uh, people playing with it and see what else that they, they could achieve. We always get surprised at what the community does with, uh, with the things that we specifically target on a specific scenarios and then we see people use them in totally different other scenarios that are so awesome. Great. So. Um, but right now, C++ CS is focused on WinRT. You're going to see a lot of uh, the WinRT underlyings showing up in mm -hmm. C++ CX. Like every platform object type is an inspectable type, which is a WinRT-only concept. 
you won't be able to have dynamic dispatching because WinRT doesn't have dynamic dispatching. And for good reasons, there is no uh, specific uh, need right now. So as, as we go in future releases, you will see both WinRT evolving and us trying to, to match that evolving and also mm -hmm. looking at different aspects of, uh, of how we can leverage it. Excellent. That. Another question comes in from Alf Steinbach. And Matt, I'm sorry, man, I can't pronounce your last name, but at least I, you know, it's Matt. So this is from Alf Steinbach. Why is there no prefix for UTF-8 encoded string literals? Oh, that's a very interesting question. So um, that was uh, one of the small things that we decided to do for, for C++ CX. I don't think it's a big feature. Um, it kind of mimics what C++ CLI was doing as well because um, C++ CX and WinRT is a wide char only environment, it's a Unicode only environment, um, there is no ambiguity when you're referring to a string whether that needs to be a white char or, or, or a multibyte. Mm. Um, it's only in C++ where you have that ambiguity because initially there were no white chars, there was only char star. So when you're writing a literal simply by writing in code something like this, we implicitly assume this is a char star literal. So when we evolved, evolved and moved to double char, we added the L in front of it. To, to disambiguate and say, okay, this needs to be stored in the process as, as a white char. Um, so you can, you still need to do that. And if you do auto, see this will, this will create the type of C will be a W char T star okay. always. Um, if you do foo, as I said, it will be char. The only scenario where it's not ambiguous, if you assign it directly to a string, and you say foo this because it's a literal and it gets assigned directly to a string hat. It cannot possibly be a char star. It's definitely a W char. So we do this small optimizations to say, well, rather than saving you a multi-byte to white char conversion, we know that this is a white char and we assign it to you. So this becomes useful not in this scenario specifically, but when you have, for example, a WinRT method mm. that takes a string hat and you just want to put the value right there. You just can write quote, you write the value that you want to pass, and then you close the quote, you don't need to put the L in. And awesome. it saves you an L. Saves you an L, man. There you go. <laughs> hey, well, hey, it's great to come and talk to you. And I know that you're also going to demo something for us. So thank you in to. advance for that. And uh, that'll come up after this. And uh, people have now learned a thing or two uh, about this. We've, we've learned about that as a boundary language. We've learned about a C++ CLI. But in some sense, like C++ CLI, it's really a small extension of the language with two or three things, maybe four things. That. It's not that big of a deal. Um, and it actually makes the, the more tedious COM programming, you know, for people who maybe have never done it, this is a great way to do COM yes. targeting WinRT. Definitely we're targeting at non-COM experts and kind of trying to hide as much of the COM mm -hmm. um, and let you start coding. But in true native fashion, you didn't hide too much. Because if you are an expert COM program like yourself or Schreeder or any number of people in the world, you can get down as low as you need to Absolutely. go. Absolutely. Including C. You uh, want to write yeah. C? Write C, man. You can do it. That works. Thanks a lot, man. Great to come and talk to you. It was great talking nice with you. Nice work on Thanks this. Thanks for having me on Channel 9. Of course, man. And come back. Absolutely. In today's demo, I like to go through some of the common uses of um, platform string and Windows runtime collections and using the C++ CX syntax. In addition to that, um, also how those types integrate with uh, STL collections and STL iterators and algorithms. And in the end, I'll briefly talk a little bit about the async methods. So what I have here is um, a XAML UI application. I'm not really good with XAML, so it's quite simplistic. and. I do have a text box uh, in which we're going to introduce our inputs a button that we'll be clicking throughout the demo. And uh, two output uh, panes. One of them is a text box, and one of them is a list box that we will use later on. So for now, let's go back to the event handler of the button, and let's write some code. So first of all, Grabbing the text of the text button will give you a platform string. So this is a um, wrapper on top of the H string, which is an immutable string in WinRT. And so as, as a result, you cannot really change it. But a few things that you can do with it, for example, you can directly pass it on to other WinRT APIs. 
And in general, if you have a very chatty interface with uh, uh, WinRT, you, you may choose to preserve the, the string hats around and keep passing them. But for example, in our example, in this uh, demo, what, we want, what I want to do is actually change the string. Um, and string hat doesn't provide you any ways of altering the content. So what we will do is move to W string, which is the standard STL string. So I'll just include the string header. And I'll declare a W string. And I'll just copy the value. of the string hat into the W string. So you see data method returns W char star. Now I can actually concatenate things. So actually what I want to do is say hello and then string plus equal text data. And let's display the string in the output window. So really quick, this I need to create a new string, a new immutable string. that will we'll take the value that we created. Actually, it should be a platform string. So let's see if this works, if I got the syntax right. Looks like I missed an L, so as expected, the white string remain white strings in C++ CX. Only if you assign to a string hat, it will actually uh, can skip the L. So as soon as I run this, we should actually see the concatenation happening and. taking a while to show up. There it is. So hello. Now we can just switch back. And obviously, usually when uh, you start inter interacting with strings, you may want to do more than just uh, uh, some simple concatenation. So what we'll do today is try to split the word into multiple words and then display them on the, string, on the, on the screen. So for that, I'll create a separate class. Let's actually go with a struct. That will require less typing. Notice is a native struct, so let's write its constructor. Its constructor will take a platform string. And as you can see, we can declare hats as, part of, uh, as members of uh, native classes, basically tying the, the, the lifetime of the reference that we're keeping to the lifetime of the C++ native object. So all I need is just to keep the string around. And a copy will be made uh, for as long as the word splitter class lives. And later on, what we want to do is create a split method that let's say just returns a standard vector of platform string. Actually, just to simplify things later on, we'll need to put this into a um, XAML UI container uh, to show it on the screen. So I'll just use object to simplify this demo. Another thing that you'll notice is that uh, this putting hat object in standard containers works and its own lifetime will be correctly managed. So now we have the string and we need to parse it. It's a string hat, uh, but as you'll notice, if I just bring up the methods, there's not a lot of uh, methods that allow me to change its content or even split it. So what we'll use as a C++ developer, we we'll go to the regex uh, syntax and Let's just bring regex in. Actually, I should bring in vector as well, since I used it below. So 
Let's go quickly and, and define a regex. This will walk through every word in the in the sentence, and uh, now we'll need to have two iterators that will actually do that. So WC because we're looking for white char. Hopefully, IntelliSense will help a little bit here. Token iterator, that's what I was looking for. And now what we're looking for is to actually par parse the sentence. Sentence being um, a string hat, I just need to pass the begin and end, and just like we, I would with a W string. I'll pass the regular expression and that we want to start from the beginning. We need another one to guard the end. Now we can walk through every word. So let's say, well, it's different than the end. I'll move to the next iterator. And what I'll do here is start accumulating the values. And I can actually return them. Now I'll create a new string with a value. And here what I would usually do is i first, i length. This will actually uh, reference inside the string and pull the a copy of the string. Uh, for the build uh, release, so there's uh, a bug where the string constructor ex expects that the string is null terminated. So to actually achieve that, we'll need to create an extra copy. This will be fixed in future releases before beta. So let's make sure I close all the parentheses. And I'll just return return value. So a few things here. Um, we were able to create um, vec uh, a vector of hats and pushback items into it. I'll make sure that this compiles in the background. Uh, we were able to create a ref new string and assign it to a platform object. This is because string inherits from object. So let's see what did I get wrong. Oh, of course, this is a dot here. I apologize for that. So now let's start actually using this type. So I would just do word splitter create the class. And it takes a constructor with a platform string. So let's pass in the text from the text input. And this will return a std vector. So it's a vector of objects. We can just assign it. Now, I know that to actually put this in, uh, in a list box, I need to do list box. item source and the type of item source is actually an I iterable of platform object. This is a WinRT collection and what we have in an, is an STL collection and to do this translation uh, we do provide a header called collection.h which makes that translation a lot easier so I'll just include the header and I'll create a platform vector which is defined in that header. A platform vector of platform object. And I'll ref new it. And because collection that it was designed with STL in mind, it, it actually just works by passing the STL vector as a parameter to the platform vector. And this will, will create a copy of those items, but only add ref the items in it. And all we need to do is an item source is actually pass the vector, because vector implements an iterable interface. So let's see that this actually works. And what we should see now 
is the text that we input being uh, broken down in words and being displayed in the list view, one word at a time. So let's just click and as you can see the two spaces uh, were added and the, the spaces were parsed and the two items were added to the list. So let's switch back. So in general uh, you would uh, interact with STL containers in your own code. You would write ISO C++ code and at some point you need to pass that information across the boundary to another component or to a WinRT API and this is the time where you should translate to platform vector. Um, not any time sooner. Of course, if you do that translation again often, uh, you should consider uh, keeping the platform vector instances around to save uh, memory and avoid extra allocations. Now, another scenario is where you get a WinRT collection coming from another component, and you will get it in the form of a platform vector, or, or more commonly, um, you may get it as a Windows foundation, collections, type, and it could be an iiterable, it could be an i-vector. Let's just take the i-vector example for now. This is a, an i-vector, and for this case, I'll just assign the platform vector to the i-vector because it implements this interface as an implicit conversion. So how would we go in code to handle, to, to reason about this type? And this is where um, our integration with STL kicks in. All you need to do is think uh, how would you uh, walk over uh, a vector in STL? And the same approach will work with the WinRT collection. So let's just go with a std for each, which is what we would do for a vector. And we'd write begin, IV, and IV. This is the start and the end of the vector. And now we have a lambda. that takes one item at a time from the vector. So there will be a platform vector, platform object hat. And now, rather than adding the full list, let's add one item at, at a time to actually see this in, uh, in real world code running. So I'll capture this as I'll need the list box here. And rather than item source, will these items append and the pen takes a platform object conveniently, so this is all we need to do to make it work. So one of the things that uh, collection.h does is defines the begin and end and the right iterators required to walk um, WinRT collections, just like you would walk any STL collections, and it enables you to use any of the STL algorithms that are available right now, like for each in the example that we just used, or earlier, the regex on strings. So the same behavior. So with that, I want to thank you. And if you have any questions, please post, post them. We'll try to uh, answer them in line. Thank you very much. Man. I think all my questions and a lot of questions people have had and questions you've had have yeah. been answered. I kept learning, you know, with all these interviews, we are Absolutely. doing demos, etc. So. so it's clear to me why C++ CX was designed the way it was. Sure. Um, it's clear to me that the seven people involved spent a lot of time. Sure. And the people that were involved were both from the C++ team and the Windows team. Uh, and they really figured out a really interesting solution. Absolutely. And I know that people wonder about the hat, why the hat was chosen. I think Jim, in his uh, his write-up on the blog, talks about it, but so does Marian. Sure. Uh, and it makes perfect sense. And then finally, um, you know, I don't think it's that big of a deal to use hats and call and use ref new, right? So th those are the two main differences. It's still C++. Yeah, yeah. So when you think about like C++ AMP, they had to extend the language. Sure. 
but just a couple things. And there's reasons that people do that. And we understand that now. So please try it out. Open your mind. If you don't want to, go ahead and use C. Absolutely. If you are <laughs> just starting today, you know, you can access the videos we publish it on and build. You will find also pointers to a lot of application samples we, we have in the code gallery. Mm -hmm. So you, you can read the articles the community are already writing. I just mentioned the case of, you know, Marius Vansila or Nishan Sivakumar. You will learn how to do data binding today and a lot of things, you know, and Excellent. it's like you can jump start at any time. Cool. And then finally, I want to say thank you to the people who provided some questions for Marion and the Facebook group, the C++ Enthusiast group. Uh, those questions were asked. I hope you like the answers. But keep on interacting with us. Sure. And uh, take care, man. Okay. All right. We'll My see pleasure. you next time. See you. All right.